What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do a deep dive into indoor grow lights and I'm going to try to explain as much as I personally know about indoor grow lights, the types, what sort of variables you have to consider when you're using them, some maintenance tips, which ones are better than the others, light costs, blah, 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 blah. There's so much to know and that's why this is a confusing topic and it doesn't really help that a lot of manufacturers uh, let's say exaggerate their claims, especially when it comes to the LED market. Now, first of all, I consider if you're growing indoors, your grow lights to be the number one most important purchase. And that is because that is your fake sun. That is your replica of the sun. And that is one of the most essential things that a plant needs to thrive. And so spending money on the right grow light is what's going to give you the biggest percentage increase in the success of your grow, right? Okay, so why do people use indoor grow lights? Well, first of all, obvious. Let's start and finish growing a plant completely indoors in the absence of light. So if you're in the winter, like many of you are right now, then you can grow a plant to completion. And it doesn't even matter what type of plant. You can grow a tomato plant if you want. Starting seeds and pre preparation for spring growing season. That's sort of another situation that many of you are in right now to finish plants off that need a little bit more sun. So let's say you want to extend your season. Well, that's another way to do it. Successfully propagate and root cuttings, another great way. You can extend daylight hours, and then you can grow plants harvested at a young age like microgreens. Microgreens, a lot of growers will grow them under lights and relatively inexpensive lights because they don't require a lot of light. Now, before we get into types of grow lights, we have to talk for sure about uh, some concepts, some light, basic light principles. Now, I am not a scientist. I am an a an amateur gardener just like you guys i'm just sharing what i know so some of this stuff i may not be phrasing it 100 correctly but this is my understanding of how this all works now the most important thing is the spectrum and so all light both visible and invisible to the human eye is going to fall somewhere on a spectrum now that spectrum is measured in nanometers which correspond to the wavelength of light now plants are using light in different wavelengths for different purposes a lot of what people will focus on is something called the PAR spectrum, which is photosynthetically active radiation. Now, if you've put those words together in your brain, you'll know that photosynthetically active radiation means light that's in a spectrum that a plant will use during the process of photosynthesis, which is what we want, right? We want our plants to be using that light to photosynthesize, produce energy, you do all of the biological processes that a plant does in order to grow big and strong. Now, there are two sort of ranges that a lot of light manufacturers will talk about. And so they'll talk about the 400 to 490 nanometer range. They'll call that the blue range. Uh, and that's because to the human eye, that appears blue. You can see on this chart right here, that's right around in this range right here. Now, there's also the 580 to 700 nanometer range. That's right about here up to the 700, right? That is orange red and plants tend to use more of that during their flowering and fruiting phase. Blue, more during the vegetative phase. Now, a lot of research has come out, plants do use light in the green range. They do use some light in the, the ranges that we cannot see, UV and, and, and infrared, IR. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but this is the way that a lot, especially LED companies have been advertising we have a blue range we have a red range we have a toggle to turn on and off we'll get into that in a bit so now we know that we want to be providing our plants with the correct spectrum of light but you know one watt of light versus a thousand watts of light is a difference in intensity so the amount of light is known as intensity that is the amount of light that is put out by your grow light and that is depending upon the power that the grow light has. And so power refers to how much electricity your grow lights use and it's measured in watts. So different types of grow lights use vastly different amounts of power. For example, LED lights consume less overall wattage than HID or high intensity discharge lights. Uh, and you can tell, well, not only because of the technology, but HID high intensity discharge implies a relatively large amount of power draw compared to other types of lighting systems. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's just sort of the way that I think about it. Now, then there's the footprint. And so we've gone over this before if you've ever listened to the podcast. So if you want to listen to that podcast, it's on Spotify and iTunes, just search Epic Gardening. But the footprint is 
it, all light comes from a source, right? If it's the sun, that is a very large source that covers half of the earth at any one time. But, you know, you can think of a light bulb as a miniature sun, and it is putting light out in a direction or many directions, depending on the type of light. And that it, what we call that is the footprint. And so the distance from a light source will increase the footprint. The further you are the further away you are from the light source, the larger that footprint will be. However, the less powerful or less intense, as we can see here, that light will be. And so if you have a thousand watt light one foot away from your plants, and then you move it two feet away from your plants, it's not half as strong. It's one fourth as strong. And if that's confusing to you, check out this article here, the inverse square law for light and hydroponics. That's why when a lot of people grow in hydroponic systems, they make mistakes because their light spacing is, is incorrect. It could be much closer and they're afraid of burning their plants. Well, that is a valid concern, but sometimes it makes a lot more sense to get it right to that point where the plant is getting just the exact peak amount of light that it can handle because as soon as you start moving it further away you're actually you're 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 incre you're decreasing the intensity by a factor of four not a factor of two so that is something to think about next you've got the photo period so what does the photo period mean photo period just means how much light are you giving your plants in a 24-hour period because we're growing indoors, we can program this, right? We're not growing outdoors where we are at the whim of the sun in the sky. This is why people grow indoors. They they can say, oh, it's fall and I want to grow tomatoes right now, but there's not enough sun and not enough intensity in the sun to grow those tomatoes. Well, I can grow them indoors, throw them under 12 hours of light every day, and then maybe change the photo period once we get to a flowering phase. So what you can see here is this is a marigold plant where the photo period is altered and you can see how the plant responds and so some plants respond to a change in photo period some do not some plants you can literally just run for 24 hours a day under the light and they'll do completely fine they'll grow faster that way some plants have processes that only take place in the absence of light and obviously that means that you cannot blast them with light 24 hours a day Okay, now we're gonna get into the types of grow lights. And this is where it can get a little confusing. And this is where a lot of people have questions. So hopefully I can answer these for you guys. The first and the most classic type of grow light is going to be the high intensity discharge light. And this is not a single type. It is best thought of as a family of lights. And so the first in the family is going to be the metal halide or MH bulb. A metal halide is going to be popular during the vegetative phase of a plant's life cycle. And the reason why is because it primarily puts out light in the four to 500 nanometer range, which is blue light, which is when a, that's the type of light that plants use more readily during their vegetative phase. So a lot of growers are going to use a metal halide light in the first stage of a plant's life, and then they will move to our next choice, the HPS or high pressure sodium light that is going to be a light that is higher in that higher nanometer range, the orange-red range, which is the, faint, the range that plants use a little bit more when they're in that flowering and fruiting phase. So you might see a lot of growers go from an MH in the beginning of a plant's life and then switch to a, a middle or a mixed light, maybe an MH and an HPS bulb, and then transition over to the HPS. That is what I've seen some people do, and they've had pretty good results. Now, there is another in the family. This is a ceramic metal halide, or a CMH. Now, you might think that this is very close to the metal halide light because it shares two of the three same words, right? Actually, it's quite different, and the spectral output is much more balanced. They have a great mix of blue, orange, and red light, which makes them a good all-around pick. So if you do not wanna fuss around with switching light to light during your growing season, well then you may wanna consider a CMH light. They come in sort of odd sizes, 315 watts, 630 watts, and um, they, they tend to be a little bit more expensive, but typically they are going to replace your HPS or MH light completely, and over time that cost curve does go down. Now. We are getting into some of the more basic lighting systems where the fluorescent light. So this is a light type that's used everywhere, right? We have fluorescent lights in our homes right now, probably. 
This is extremely popular for the beginning stages of a plant's life cycle. So a lot of hobbyists, myself included, are going to use a fluorescent light for starting seeds, nurturing transplants, nurturing clones, and maybe even growing something like microgreens. And the reason why is because they're very efficient from an energy standpoint. They don't put out a lot of heat. However, they don't put out a whole lot of light intensity. Of course, that that changes. You can get a fluorescent system that puts out quite a bit in as far as intensity goes, but you'll need a lot of tubes. It might be a little bit bulky and unwieldy. And typically, people do not grow solely under fluorescence unless, like I said, they're growing something like a microgreen that you harvest right at the beginning of its life cycle. So it does not need a whole lot of light. There is a subset in here that's the high intensity fluorescent or the HO or VHO. You'll see that on the fluorescent tubes when you buy them. HO and, and VHO just stand for high output and very high output. Creative name there, I know. Um, these are more powerful. They run a little hotter and so they, they can best be thought of as a slight intensity boost as compared to fluorescence, but definitely less intense on average than the MH, HPS or CMH bulbs, anything in that HID category. Now, we have the big kahuna, light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. So, four, five, six years ago, when LEDs really started to pop on the growing market, they were met with a lot of skepticism because manufacturers were making these crazy outlandish claims about the e effectiveness and efficiency of their LED systems, and they were just a new lighting technology, and old-school hydroponic growers were very suspicious. Now, these days, LED lighting is a lot more established. It is incredibly popular among some growers, and for good reason. They put out a very little amount of heat, very small amount of heat, and not a lot of energy, but they can still put out a decently intense amount of light in the right spectral ranges. And the reason why uh, a lot of people like LEDs is because they are individual diodes that you use a lot of to comprise an entire lighting system. And those diodes can be colored, right? So you can output the exact nanometer spectrum range of the light that you want. And so a lot of the times when you buy an LED, you'll see, it'll say, we have five diodes at the 580 nanometer. We have 10 diodes at the 600 nanometer range. And so you can almost plug and play and mess around with your spectrum in a very custom way. Next, we have plasma. So plasma grow lights are somewhat of a newcomer to the lighting industry. They have pretty incredible claims about their efficiency. And in many ways, it actually feels a lot like when LEDs first came in the market. People are saying, this is going to replace everything. Don't worry about anything else. You only need this. So there are some unique advantages to plasma bulbs. First of all, that is a cool looking light right there, if you ask me. It kind of looks like it's from the future. Uh, but plasma bulbs tend to last quite quite a bit longer than HID alternatives, and they put out a better spectrum of light as compared to an MH or an HPS bulb, but they are quite a bit more expensive, and unless you're using them for a long period of time, you're probably not going to recoup that investment in any way. So they just need to be run for quite a while in order to make sense of that. And so here is an interesting question, because a lot of people don't know how much money they'll be paying in their electricity bill on top of whatever they normally use in their house. And so what I have here is a grow cost calculator, and it's relatively simple, and I have some pretty standard setups over here. So the only thing you need to add is what is your kilowatt hour cost in cents? So kilowatt hour, if you don't know, is running one kilowatt worth of energy for an hour. How much does that cost you? And so let's just say it costs me five cents, right? I'm gonna run it for 18 hours a day and you can see this chart is updating. So if I'm running a 600 watt HPS, which is a fairly standard system, well, that's gonna cost me 54 cents a day or almost $200 a year to run. Now, if I'm running in 100 watt HPS, you can see that goes quite a bit, quite a ways up. And you can see that a, a uh, 190 watt LED, which is which a lot of people will advertise as a 450 watt equivalent, uses a lot less energy. But the reason why it's using less energy is because it's 190 watts and not 450 watts. Uh, and so when they say it's a 450 watt equivalent, that's not really very accurate. Um, what they're trying to say there is it's going to put out as much light as a 450 watt HID lamp. Um, whether that's the best way to think about lighting is up for debate. Personally, I don't think so. I think that the actual amount of wattage is slightly better as a measure. Now, let's get into, before we close this video out, some additional things you would need. 
if you're going to grow with one of these types of lights. And so the first thing is if you're using an HID system, you're going to need a ballast of some kind. And a ballast is just a piece of equipment that helps your HID bulbs run optimally. Uh, and I won't get into too much more besides that, but needless to say, you're probably going to need an electronic ballast if you have an HID bulb. Now, we've got reflectors and hoods. These are sort of the same thing. The idea here is to direct the light in the direction that you want. And so if you have a bulb like this one on the left here, you can see it's going to be throwing light upwards. And if you don't have this reflector right here, well, that light's just going to be bouncing off the ceiling and it's really not going to it's basically going to be wasted because as we've learned with the inverse square law of light the further away a light source is the less intense it is by the square of the distance and so unless you're redirecting light in the direction that you want it to go you're actually just wasting quite a bit of energy and so a grow light ref reflector is more or less essential when it comes to growing indoors now there's some maintenance stuff that a grow light requires. I'm not really gonna get into that. We can talk about that in another video. As you can see, there's a lot of different calculations as far as when a bulb is going to degrade. So when does a bulb run out or at what point does a bulb put out such a low amount of light that you may as well replace it? That is different for every bulb. As you can see, HID, T5, and LEDs all degrade at different rates. LEDs certainly the the longest lasting bulbs out there. Now, that is all I have for you today on indoor grow lights. I really sincerely hope this was a good first look at them. If it was, definitely hit the like button, definitely hit the subscribe button, and there's a button down below that's like a little bell thing. Uh, that'll let you know that I have a new video coming out. So if you wanna join the notification squad, I think other people are calling it the notification squad. I'm gonna call it the epic squad. If you wanna join the epic squad, then hit the little bell uh, and you'll get a little thing on YouTube. It'll say, Hey, Kevin from Epic Gardening made a new video. So thank you so much for listening, guys. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. I literally respond to every single comment ever, unless it's some sort of a really rude thing. I, then I just delete that. But uh, <laughs> besides that, I definitely respond to every comment. And one more thing before you go, I have a book that will be coming out spring 2019 called The Urban Gardener's Field Guide. And it's gonna give you everything you need to know to grow indoors, outdoors, in any small space that you live in. So if you live in an apartment, a condo, a townhome, a single family home, and you're trying to squeeze out as much growing space as possible, then that is the book for you. It's not done yet. I'm still working on it. In fact, I've only just begun. And so what I'm asking you today is to join the early readers beta list. And if you want to get on that list, you just go to epicgardening.com forward slash book, and I will see you on that list. And basically what it is, is you're going to get advanced DIY guides, advanced plans, early release chapters. We'll, you'll be able to talk and we'll, we'll say, hey, what do you think would make sense in this book? What, what are you really struggling with? What do you want to learn more about? And so I'm really trying to make it a book that's for you and in some senses by you because I'm going to get a lot of the ideas for what you'd like me to cover from you guys. So that's it. Until next time, good luck in the garden. Keep growing and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.